This talk is about self-management support strategies um, that is part of the chronic care model. And I know you're wondering perhaps why we're talking about this in the quality improvement um, arena. But the reason is that this provides you with lots of tools that you can use for quality improvement. If you remember a lot of quality improvement is what kind of changes you make. And these are the tools to help you make the changes that you need. So the objectives of this particular talk are to describe the core components of the self-management support, to apply all of these components to patient-specific situations. So for each of these components, I'm going to tell a story as an example about how you can use this. And we'll do this in future talks about all the other components of the chronic care model. Um, to describe the impact of health literacy on health outcomes, because that's really important, and a brief slide about uh, the theoretical evidence base for self-management support, so that you appreciate that there is uh, quite a bit of scientific evidence for the uh, value of this particular intervention um, model. So why is this important? Well, all healthcare providers uh, know that um, helping, helping patients adopt a healthy lifestyle to either prevent or ameliorate the impact of chronic illness is far and away the greatest challenge. Um, we put a lot of effort on health education, but knowledge is clearly an insufficient motivating factor. Um, it is a factor. We need to know, patients need to know how to do things, and that's what we'll talk about with regard to health literacy. But it isn't sufficient, and we know that because everybody knows that smoking is bad for you or that not wearing your seatbelts is dangerous, but still people smoke, 25% of the population smoke, and a lot of people don't wear their seatbelts even though it's against the law not to wear your seatbelts in many states. So clearly there's more to it than health education, and that more to it is what we call a group of interventions that are called self-management support strategies, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about those in this uh, class. Um, self-management support strategies is a very comprehensive approach to behavioral change with patients. Some assumptions um, of self-management support strategies, the two critical assumptions is that, and you know this, we all know this, patients must be responsible for their day-to-day -day health behaviors. We can't go behind them and remind them every minute of every day what their health behavior should be. And not only that, but patients really, and think about it in your life, are required to make dozens if not hundreds of decisions every day that impact on their health. From what you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to whether or not you go for, you know, how far you park from the Walmart. I, there's so many decisions that we make on a daily basis. And these are strategies that give the patients tools for helping them make those hundreds of decisions that we can't be there um, with them to make. Um, the self-management support strategies initially began by working with chronic illness care, and that's certainly what we're going to talk about today. People with um, heart disease or heart disease risk and with diabetes or risk for diabetes. But clearly these um, strategies can be applied much broader, and so as you learn these strategies, certainly feel free to think about using them in accident and injury prevention, like wearing a helmet when you ride your bike and uh, seat belts, things like that, and, uh, and help healthy lifestyle decisions. So it's much broader than that, but we're going to focus on chronic illness care. There are four, three, I'm sorry, core areas of focus, and then there are five strategies, so it gets a little numeric here. But, but self-management support focuses on these three things. Uh, first of all, the medical and behavioral management. And this is the patient's ability to manage their condition or their risk for condition. Um, the most obvious examples are focusing on their healthy eating um, and on taking their medications. Um, the second one, however, and we forget about both of these two, we spend, again, just like health education, we spend all of our time with that first focus, but there are two others. The first is role management, the ability to adjust life roles based on their health needs. I don't know how many of you have been diagnosed with a chronic illness like um, coronary artery disease or diabetes or hypertension, but think about how you have to go about the possibility of labeling yourself as, as different because you now are a person with hypertension, you now are a person with diabetes, and that literally has to affect your life roles. 
And then that merges into this effective or emotional health. Um, you have to learn to accept this illness and risk and manage the emotions associated with it. I, I remember a patient once that was so angry about being diagnosed with hypertension. And she kept saying, well, my sister-in-law doesn't have hypertension and she's heavier than I am. And, uh, you know, there were all these things. She fought it for probably a year. It was very interesting to watch this whole process. She did not want to be a person with hypertension. And so think about the patients that you have or think about yourself and how this is part of what you have to learn to accept about yourself and your patients have to learn to accept about themselves. And I've had patients, frankly, who have become suicidal when they've been diagnosed with these things that you and I perhaps think of as common everyday occurrences telling somebody something as simple as they have hypothyroid or they have diabetes. But for some people, these are really devastating. And for many people, we have to appreciate how devastating this news is. So recognizing that we're focusing on those three things, there are five skills that we help our patients to learn in this group of self-management support strategies. And if you look at this, these are not health education. This isn't the skill passing a test on, you know, diabetes and, or on hypertension. So these skills are problem solving, things like what do I do if I take my medication at the wrong time or forget my meds when I travel. Uh, decision making, making the decision about what to eat. Uh, resource utilization, how to optimize the resources in the community. Uh, being an empowered patient and then taking action. So we're going to go into each of these skills in some depth. And as we do that, think back to those three areas of focus, the medication, the illness management, um, but also the emotional response and the adjustment to the role of being a person with a chronic illness. So let's talk about problem solving. And problem solving starts with something as simple as teaching people the problem solving process. And it can be very complex, but we'll make it just these four steps. First of all, identifying what the problem is and defining it. Um, and so talking with a patient about, well, what's the problem? What's the definition? What are some options for solutions? How are you going to implement it? And then whether it works or not. And so we're going to use as an example um, for a couple of slides the story of Jane. And Jane is a patient who has newly diagnosed hypertension, and she knows that she needs to lose some weight and get more exercise. And she wants to do it, but she says to you, I do not have the time or the resources to exercise. And so that's, she wants to do it, uh, but she says that she does not have the time or resources. So how do we help Jane to problem solve through this um, situation? So we have to help Jane learn to problem solve. And so we review the skills or the steps, help her clarify and define the problem, list the options. She has to make her own decision. She has to identify how she'll evaluate the outcome of her decision. And as she moves through these steps, you can give her feedback and coach her, but you shouldn't offer her solutions. So Jane has told you that she wants to walk more, but she doesn't have the time and she doesn't have the um, resources. So you can say to her, well, Jane, talk about some opportunities within your day that you have where you could um, you might define the problem. You want to exercise, but you don't have the resources or the time. So let's adjust. Let's deal with time first. And so you might say to her, Jane, let's talk about some, why don't you tell us some um, options for getting more exercise that occur in the course of your day? And so Jane can say, okay, well, I go to work and I sit all day and I can't leave my desk because I'm too busy. And you can say, well, are there any places that you can get more exercise in this? And she says, well, I could park further out in the parking lot and I could take the stairs. Um, and, you know, and, and so she might say, I, those might be two things that she says, you know, that would work because those are things I do every day. Anyhow, it doesn't take any time. It doesn't take any resources. The only resource really is a little bit of extra time to walk from the car to the, to the building and to take the stairs. Um, but she says, you know, I think I can do that. And so she says, okay, I'm going to make a decision to, to walk, to park further away and to take the stairs every day. 
And so then you can say to her, how will she know that, it, how will she evaluate this? And she can talk about, well, if I do it, if I do it, then it works. And if it, if it doesn't work, you know, we can talk about why it doesn't. And as we go further in this presentation, we'll talk about goal setting. But that's an example of how, just a very simple example of problem solving. Okay, here's the problem. You list the options and let's move through it. And again, you've given her feedback and say, well, you know, that's a good idea. And you have to give her coaching feedback. I mean, let's face it, you know, parking the car 15 parking places further away or taking one flight of stairs may not seem to you like much exercise, but you have to give her feedback because you have to say, this is, this is great. This is increasing your activity and you're doing as part of your normal day. And we have to take baby steps here. It's all about baby steps. So the next uh, skill is decision making, and we talked about that. Patients are confronted with dozens of decisions a day that help affect their health. Um, how they make these decisions will affect their confidence and their ability to take care of themselves. That's another thing. I think we don't appreciate how lacking patients can be in confidence about their ability to care for themselves. And most decision making is based on, uh, must, uh, most decision making should be based on sufficient information and knowledge of options and so we have to support it by education they have to know the their um the impact of their decisions and then help them develop the skills so we're going to use george as an example here so george is a 45 year old man who's learned that he has high cholesterol and he needs to improve his diet and so in order to make good decisions regarding his diet, we need to help with skills and knowledge. And so in the case of decision making, the first thing you have to do is help George um, know what his diet has to be. Now, one of the things we tend to do um, as a first step is, is to start providing information. Well, here's what you need to eat. Well, pull back and say, wait a minute, what is George eating now? And so this is when you say, okay, let's do a 24-hour recall of his diet. And so you walk through what his diet is and then give him feedback, which is knowledge very specific to George's diet about his um about his diet and how he can make changes. So let's say George for breakfast um, usually has a couple of fried eggs. Well, we all know that that's not, that needs to change. And so you can say to George, well, those fried eggs have a lot of cholesterol in them. And, you know, we really need you to cut your eggs down to say four eggs a week. And so what, you know, and then we can problem solve with George about what he could do. So now we're moving back into problem solving about what other kinds of things he could eat for breakfast that would work for him and and help him with that. And so we go back and forth between decisions and problem solving. But again, starting with what he does. And let's say for lunch, he goes to the um, local restaurant and has a salad for lunch. And um, you say, well, that's really good. That's, that's going to help. That's a lot of fiber and, and vegetables. That's good and perhaps ask him a little bit about the dressing he uses on the salad. But again, you know, I want to remind you that you want to take baby steps. So you don't want George to go home and suddenly live an entire new lifestyle tomorrow. It's not going to work. And so look at what he's doing now. Look at ways that he can make little changes. Um, when we talk about goals, I can talk, maybe I've already talked about a patient I had who he and his wife were both having four fried eggs a day and we got them down to two. Um, obviously, they still need to cut that back, but that's a major change in their life and so that's positive. So you need to help George by looking at his diet and making the right decisions. Not by giving him a piece of paper about what you need to eat with healthy, you know, to lower your cholesterol. Start with what he is eating. Here are some skills and knowledge that George needs for decision making. First of all, he needs to be able to read labels. He needs to recognize hidden sources of fat, learn good from bad fat, uh, learn the impact of fiber and exercise on fat. And so we need to, you know, you need to talk about not just fat, but fiber. And so to help him make his decision, he needs feedbacks. And, and 
his, so this decision support must be ongoing and every time he comes in you need to help him with new decisions that he makes and and again I want to go back to this you don't make all of his changes overnight and so maybe you start with eggs at breakfast and then the next time he comes in you say George how are you doing on that and in fact when we move forward on this you'll see that you don't wait for the next time you call him in a week or two and say George how are you doing with your eggs is this working and if this is working, say, well, George, are you ready to make another change? And and then you can go back. Um, have you been practicing reading labels? Have you have you kept a log of what you're eating? Um, are you making some high fiber choices? So you can you're you're going back and forth in a dialogue with George about his decisions. It's the only way it's going to work. You can't just provide him a piece of paper. You can't just say, here's what you have to do. You have to be in dialogue with his life and with him about what's going to work. And you have, you know, we'll talk about this later, but the whole, the secret of success is relentless follow through. Um, so you're always in dialogue. And this is why it's important for all of you, not just the provider, to, to be engaged in this, the, the, you know, the, the medical assistant who checks George in, the nurse who takes his vitals, all of these people have to be engaged in this dialogue with George to help him be successful. Now, I want to insert something about health literacy in here. Um, as we move along, it's not specific to self-management support, but health literacy is a concept that's essential to self-management support. And the definition is the ability to read, hear, comprehend, and act on health and medical information. And I think the first thing that we want to do with regard to health literacy is to make sure that our patients are comfortable telling us when they don't understand what we say. I remember once having a conversation with a patient. I was going on and on and talking about this problem being acute. And finally, the patient says, I don't know what you mean by the word acute. And um, that really struck me about how even things that we think are so simple, patients don't always um, know. And I was so glad she was able to say that and I gave her feedback. Um, accordingly to say I'm so glad you're able to ask that. But let's go into why health literacy is important in the next couple of slides. First of all, studies show that health literacy has a significant impact on the patient's ability to make effective decisions and participate in their health care. The lower a patient's health literacy, the poorer their health outcomes. Um, and, and we see this every day. And I don't think you and I, who, who have fairly high levels of health literacy, can appreciate in a day-to-day -day basis how little some patients know about good health decisions. And again, I'm always telling stories because I think that's an important way to learn. But I remember a patient who, a mother, who had a nine-month-old who was a failure to thrive. And they were all, we were really working hard with this mom. But I, you can't appreciate how low health literacy is until you find out that a patient discloses they're having four fried eggs in the morning. And in the case of this mom, I came into the exam room and here's this little nine month old sitting on the exam table and the mother is feeding this child Cheetos. Uh, <laughs> it was just inconceivable to me that anybody would feed a nine month old baby Cheetos. And um, of course this baby was failing to thrive. Well, this was a, a this wasn't a, um, a a mom who, who didn't care for this baby. She just didn't know any better. And so, of course, this baby isn't going to do well because her health literacy is so low. So we have to really open our minds to the possibilities for how little our patients really understand about their behavior and their health. And don't think for one minute that these are just your, your, that you know the patients who are Ill, uh, that have poor health literacy. Um, studies in this country have shown that up to half of people in the United States have some degree of health illiteracy. Uh, there are some people who are at increased risk. People who live in poverty um, for a variety of reasons have lower capacity and so they're going to have lower health literacy. Elderly people often have lower health literacy. Recent immigrants because they just aren't acculturated to our society and the unemployed and again the unemployed that all ties into low socioeconomic status, poverty 
and and so just because uh you know i mean a person might be very literate and and um be unemployed but but these are people who you should have little red flags that they might have low health literacy but but don't don't assume that because somebody is you know well educated and prosperous that they know everything they need to know about their health here are some strategies to overcome low health literacy we all know this but let's talk about it uh, using plain lay language, um, for example, using the term low or high blood pressure, I should have said, said high blood pressure there, sorry, that's a typo, uh, rather than hypertension. Uh, remember the word when I said acute? <laughs> um, so using a word low blood pressure or high blood pressure, um, limit the amount of information given at any one time. Oh my goodness, I see my students all the time, give people all this information. And I'll tell you, one of the things I do is I write everything out too. If I have four main points that I want a patient to know, I do two things. First of all, I do that third bullet, which is teach back. And so if I have a fairly complicated scenario with a patient that I want them to do in the terms of medication or something, I'll say to them at the end of the encounter, okay, now tell me what you're going to do. So they tell you back what you said. There's some amazing research that says that alone can significantly improve health outcomes. Use physical diagrams if you need to to show people what you're talking about. Use, make sure that literature has a low literacy level um, in other words, it's like at the sixth grade level or lower and that it's visually appealing. But like I said, I often write out, I have little forms, health education forms, and I will write out bullet one, you know, take, you know, for days one through four, take this pill in the morning and day five, six, seven, take it in the evening, whatever. Um, I write it out very clearly, but make sure that all the literature you use is appealing and has a low literacy level. We're moving back to self-management self support strategies and going into resource utilization. And, you know, we talked about this in earlier talks. Um, you really need to know what resources you have in your community. And I appreciate that you all live in communities that often are very rural and very isolated and you may not have many resources. So you might have to know what resources are available online or, or just individuals in the community who can help people with problems. Resources that include social support, national organizations, and internet site, and you need to coach the patient to seek and use these resources. And that includes follow-up to ensure that they follow through. So you say, for example, I might say, okay, I want you to go to Jesse Tree. Jesse Tree is an organization here in my community that does diabetes education. And I want you to go on Friday morning, they have these 10 o'clock classes on at the, you know, at the shelter. And um, and can you go? I, you know, I verify that this is doable for them. And then, you know, I might say the next time they come, did you go to Jesse Tree? How did that work for you? So you want to be sure, again, this relentless follow-up. So here's a story. Jose and Maria to helping them to use resources. Jose has recently been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. His wife, of course, does all the cooking, and she has no idea how to modify her cooking for her. They're recent immigrants. Um, they um, Neither one of them are highly literate. They don't read Spanish or English well. Um, many of my Hispanic patients um, do not read Spanish well, and so that's something they have very low literacy levels, often new immigrants, and so that's something to check. But in my community, I'm very fortunate, and I'm making this up, but there's a Hispanic support center that provides cooking classes for people with type 2 diabetes. So, of course, I want Jose and Maria to go to these classes. And so, um, what do I do? How do I enable that? And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Well, Lucy, who is my medical assistant and my interpreter because I do not speak Spanish, tells Jose and Marie about these classes and gives them the phone number to call to enroll in the next course. But that's not all Lucy does. A week later, Lucy makes a note on her calendar. A week later, she calls and talks to Maria. And Maria says, well, I called once, but I got an answering machine, and I didn't know what to do, so I hung up. 
And um, that's not uncommon. And so Lucy encourages Maria to call again. And then two days later, Lucy calls and says that Maria finds out that Maria has in fact called and enrolled in classes that start next Thursday. And so what's Lucy going to do? Relentless follow up. Ru Lucy makes a note to call Maria on Wednesday to verify that she and Jose plan to attend the class. And then, of course, on that Friday, she's going to make a note that to call and make sure they attended and how it worked and were there any concerns or questions. This is how, <laughs> this is, there's several points here. One is that this is how you improve your clinical outcomes. But the other point that I think is even more important is the engagement of everybody in the practice in this. You know, this isn't me calling Jose and Maria to make sure they're doing it. This is Lucy, my medical assistant. She can engage much better with Maria than I can because I don't speak Spanish and because I don't even understand Maria's world the way Lucy does. And Lucy and I have spent a lot of time over the year, over the years, you know, learning this. And, and I have engaged her in in this so that she she owns this role and she owns the idea that these patients are getting better as much as I do. So she's, you know, it's all about the team in this case. So let's move on to the empowered patient role. And uh, patients are frequently very intimidated by healthcare professionals. Again, a typo, sorry, and are hesitant to stand up for themselves. When patients do ask questions or question a decision, they're often labeled a difficult patient. I know you all don't do that, but I do know some people who do. What they are, however, is an empowered patient, and that's what you really want. You want people who stand up and ask questions and question a decision. To, you want to encourage that. They need to be empowered. It's their body, their health. They have every right to, to have the primary control. And, and in this day and age, what we call that is patient-centered care. Um, and I think that's actually a very good idea. So how do we empower patients? Well, there are lots of ways. We can encourage patients to ask questions. You know, at the end of an encounter, I always say before I walk out of the room, and I do not say it with my hand on the door. <laughs> I say it sitting there looking at the patient. Do you have any questions? Is there anything you're worried about? And then if I have to leave the room and come back for something, I'll say, well, think about it. I'm going to be back in a minute after I write these prescriptions and get this information. And if you think of any questions, you can ask me then. Provide positive feedback when patients do ask questions um, and, and say that's good. There is a program that's downloadable, and I apologize. I have not double-checked this um, hyperlink in a while, but um, called Ask Me Three that has brochures in English and Spanish, and they emphasize the importance of asking three questions at each healthcare encounter. Now, as you might guess, the next slide will have those three questions in it, I hope. There they are, the three questions that you want your patient to ask at each encounter. What is my main problem? What do I need to do about this? And why is this important? And so if they, um, you know, you can answer the questions in advance. Um, tell them what their main problem is, what they need to do about why it's important. Again, I use that teach back strategy where they tell you back what, what they learned. Do you, you know, tell me why this is important is a good question to ask the patient. And so these are the three questions. Obviously, you don't need to use them verbatim, but the idea is that you, this patient leaves the encounter knowing what their main problem is, what they need to do about it, and why it's important. And they can answer those questions if asked. So how do you teach empowerment? This is really fairly simple. Have those brochures available. At the end of each counter, ask patients to tell you the answer to the three questions. Reinforce the importance of doing this at each at all health visits. So you might say, you know, have the brochure in your hand and say, these are the three questions that I want you to be able to answer. Ask them if they know the answer to the questions and then hand them the brochure and say, this is something I want you to think about and remember that you need to do at the end at, at every healthcare encounter. So here's a good story about empowered patient. Um, Peggy comes in for a visit and her healthcare provider told her she has osteoarthritis. And that's her problem. That's why she's having this body pain. And she's going to get some medicine for this. This is great medicine. It's going to help her deal with this. And she gets a slew of information about the cause and management of osteoarthritis. 
Okay, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You've done everything right. You provided her with all the information, given her a truckload of information. Peggy leaves, and she, you know, and she's getting some blood drawn. Maybe it's time for her annual blood. I don't know. She's getting blood drawn, and she says to Nancy, the nurse who is drawing the blood, that she is terrified. And she did not, and again, I apologize for the typo, did not understand anything she was told, and she is terrified that she's going to be handicapped. Um, and she's getting the many different kinds of arthritis mixed up. She thinks she has rheumatoid arthritis. She has this idea of becoming deformed. But then she says, but the doctor or the provider gave me this medicine, and I'm wondering if it's going to cure me. So I'm going to take this medicine, and it's going to make it all go away. So at the end of two weeks, I'll be fine. And so Peggy clearly has not processed all of this. And Nancy, the nurse, I'm sorry to be so pro, you know, so... Um, I don't know. Anyhow, Nancy is getting all of this information, so her job, of course, is to help calm Peggy down, but also to empower her. So after drawing Peggy's blood, Nancy takes Peggy into the counseling room. I know, not everybody has a counseling room. But into the education room, whatever you want to call it, some nice quiet place where they can sit down and talk for a few minutes. And Peggy starts by telling, or Nancy starts by telling Peggy that she wants to review a few important points and that she and Peggy can spend more time together later as she has new questions. And at that point, she goes through the ask me three questions. And that's all she's talking about. Why is this important? What's going to happen? And, and then at the end of that time, she will, of course, make sure that Peggy understands what she's told her. But again, notice that this isn't the provider per se. This is another member of the staff engaging in this process. It has to be a team. So here are the ask me three questions, and we're going to go through them, each one a different slide. What is Peggy's main concern? It's that she's going to be crippled and unable to work. And at this time, Nancy explains that this type of arthritis is not generally crippling, but it mostly causes pain and some limited movement. And so that's one answer to her main concern. I'm trying to find the... <laughs> so what does Peggy need? to do. What does she need to do about these things? Four simple things. Number one, she needs to take her medication as directed. Number two, she needs to keep moving. She needs to walk. She needs to exercise, swim, whatever she likes to do. Number three, she needs to keep a list of, medic of a questions for her next appointment. And number four, she needs to keep her next appointment four very simple things. You know, Nancy can write these out on a piece of paper that Peggy can put on her refrigerator. And remember, she must take her medication. She must keep moving. She must start. Every time she thinks of a question, write it down and keep her next appointment with that list of questions. Now, I know the providers, I've been there. Sometimes these patients come in with a list of patients a page long, and, you know, you have to find ways to deal with it. But um, she needs to do that. That's how, that's how we get good outcomes. Okay, it's not just about what she needs to do, but why are these things important? What is the medication going to do? It's going to help with her pain. It's going to make it easier for her to move. It is not going to cure her. So it's going to help with the pain and make it easier for her to move. What it, why is moving important? Because it helps keep the joints flexible and decreases stiffness. Why keep a list of questions so that she doesn't have to remember them when she comes into the office? All of us have have sort of, you know, a little bit of anxiety when we go to the doctor's office, the clinic, and keep her next appointment. I apologize. Boy, this slideshow is just full of typos, but keep her next appointment so that we know how she's doing, that the medicine's working, she's not having any side effects, and so that we can address these next, uh, these additional questions. But the, you know, so those are two important things. So we know how she's doing, that the medicine and moving are working, and we can address these questions. Now, this is the um, really the second half of this um, particular um, lecture, and it's I know it's a long lecture, and so if you need to, and I'll, I'll let you all know this 
in preparation too, you might want to uh, take a break at this point. And this is the halfway point really in this talk, but it's about the whole, all of these strategies for helping people to Im take action to improve their health. So it's really important information, but it's a, a long show and I apologize for that. And this is far and away the most complex step of self-management support, although like many things in healthcare, once you get used to it, you do it automatically. And so it becomes fairly easy. There are six strategies that we're going to talk about. I've alluded to a lot of them already to assist patients to be successful with changing their behavior. Um, the first is ask, tell, ask, closing the loop, establishing an agenda, collaborative decision making, including assessing readiness for change, collaborative decision making, goal setting, and follow up. So we've talked about a lot of this. So most of the time we'll be on goal setting, but let's, um, let's move ahead here. Ask, tell, ask is based on the adult learning principle of self-directed learning. A novel idea here, but what you do is ask the patient what they would like to know more about. So if you um, are done with your encounter and, and you have some time, or maybe the nurse, what, you know, maybe the nurse after they've seen the provider might say to the patient is what, you know, as she's drawing the blood or whatever, what more would you like to know about from today? Tell them the information, keeping it brief and simple, and ask if they have any other questions. So just making sure, like I said, at the end of an encounter, I always say, what else would you like to know about today? Providing them with that, keeping it brief, and asking if they have any questions. That's called ask, tell, ask. Many of you probably already do this. I talked about this one um, earlier, um, the teach back. Um, but it's the follow-up to ask, tell, ask. It's closing the loop. And again, there's there's research, amazing research on how well this works. But after you do the ask, tell, ask, you ask the patient to restate the information you provided. And studies show that this simple strategy is very effective in improving health behavior. As you move from um, information to behavior change, so you you know obviously people have to have information first. But you must assume that a patient is more likely um, to act based on his or her values and priorities than those of the providers. You know, we think what we tell them is most important, but the truth of the matter is, you know, what they do is based on what is important to them. Based on the problem and the discussion you've had, you can ask a patient um, which of several areas they would like to work on. So let's say we're talking to a patient who has diabetes and their A1C is not good and they're having some problems. And, you know, there's, there's all sorts of complications. The patient says, I just can't get control of my hypertension, and I just don't know what's wrong, and say, well, you know, there are lots of things you, you can do with regard to your hypertension. There's your medication, there's diet, there's exercise, there's stress management. Let's not look at the whole thing. Say to the patient, pick one, pick the thing that is most problematic or most troubling you, and let's work on this for a while. And that's called establishing the agenda and makes a lot of sense. Let's just work on one thing. People get too overwhelmed. And so let's uh, focus on one item. Or you can say to the patient, um, what behavior change would you like to focus on regarding your health? Or say, what do you think is your biggest challenge to being healthy? And then follow through on that with how do you want to work on this? Uh, you know, for example, for me, my biggest challenge is, is healthy eating or getting enough or stress management. And say, well, how do you want to follow through? How would you like to work on this? Now, let's say the patient says exercise is my biggest challenge. One of the things about this whole focus is, is looking at readiness to change. There's a whole whole theoretical model about this that you really probably don't need to know about. But the idea is, the basic premise is, you have to determine whether a person's ready to change. Um, for example, you all know people who smoke and, and you want them to stop smoking and what you really should say to people is you need to stop smoking, how can I help you? And people are going to say, I am not ready to stop smoking and, and you can, you know, Verify that in several ways. Say, well, you need to. Can I help you? No, I'm not ready. I don't want to talk it. Okay, they're not ready. 
Smoking is not the thing you should work on. Even though you believe that this is the most important thing, you have to. So say, perhaps, to the patient, well, what, what is keeping you? What could we work on? Why can't you stop smoking? Well, I'm under all this stress. And so maybe stress management is something that needs to be worked on. So you work on stress management, not on smoking. And, and so you, and so then say to the patient, are you ready to work on that? Are you ready to work on exercise? And then you have to set goals and determine in their confidence and their ability to change based on the goal. And we'll talk about all this in more detail. Okay, so ba readiness to change. Based on the assumption a patient is not going to change a behavior, then they're not ready to change. This is sort of one of those does. Um, at this point, therefore, you need to validate that whatever behavior you're going to work on is a behavior that they're ready to change. And again, for those of you who want to go look at the theory of this, this is called the trans theoretical model of change. And uh, those of you who've been to graduate school know about it, but the rest of you don't, and frankly, you won't, uh, don't need to lose any sleep not knowing about it. Not that it's not important. Here are some, um, uh, we're going to go through each stage of change and then talk about what your role is in this change. Pre-contemplation. This is the stage that I talked about earlier, the patient is not interested in changing, and your role is to confront them with the need to change, ideally in a personalized manner. So a patient comes in complaining of shortness of breath. So you personalize it. Your shortness of breath is due to your smoking. You need to stop. How can I help you? Um, or you might say, you know, you're smoking, your child has an ear infection, and the reason they have all these ear infections when the parent says, oh, I don't know why they get all these ear infections, because you smoke. You need to stop smoking. How can I help you? And so that's, the, that's what you do with this pre-contemplation change. Confront them with the need to change in a personalized manner and offer to help. You know, this is not being rude or, or it's, just, it's just being direct. In the next phase, the patient is contemplating change. And they know they need to change and they're actually considering it, but they just don't know where to begin and they're very anxious and they often lack confidence in their ability to change. And again, this is something we may not think about, but you don't, don't always appreciate that a patient just doesn't believe they could do this. They've never perhaps been successful at it. Your role is to provide encouragement and support and acknowledge and support their ability to change. So saying something like, Jane, I know you can do this because, and again, personalizing it, I saw how well you did in improving your exercise last year. Or you've had to start taking medicine every day, and I know that you've been faithful at taking your medicine. So see, there's an example of how you successfully changed. So now I know you can do this. So this is that coaching role. And again, as much as you can personalize it, the, the better. In the third phase, they're preparing to change and they need to develop an action plan. And so your role is to work with them on that action plan. And that involves goal setting. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So you want to start biking. That sounds like a good idea. I'll be glad to help you set up a plan. And you might find out if they have a bike. <laughs> and um, so, you know, so that's a good example of saying, great, let's set up a plan for you. Let me, let me coach you in this. You know, the, the important thing is that you're, you're telling them that you're engaged in this with them. The next phase in readiness to change is action, where they're actually implementing the action plan, and your role is to continue to support them and continue to help with goal setting. So a, a good example, we talked about this earlier, this idea of phone calls. Hi, Mike, this is Dr. Smith. I called to see how your biking plan is going. How did you do it meeting your goals this week? And, you know, if they say, gee, it didn't work, well, go back and, and rethink. Let's, we'll talk about goal setting. Go back and set the goals again. Why didn't it work? You know, okay, well, then maybe that was the wrong goal. Maybe the goal was to, you know, maybe you said you were going to bike five times a week and you only bike two. Um, well, why, what happened those other three times? Maybe we need to rethink this. So 
we'll talk about this in more detail, but this idea that you support them and make phone calls. I mean, you really should be setting aside time every day to contact patients and see how they're doing. This is how you get improved clinical outcomes. The next phase is maintenance. And so the patient successfully changed their behavior and is moving forward, but they do have risk for relapse. And your job is to continue to support and provide reassurance when there is relapse, that it's not the end, there's always tomorrow. And this is really important. And so just things as simple as at an office visit saying things like, Jackie, I see you're still losing weight. This is great. How are things going? Is really important at this point. And the final phase is termination. Um, sounds kind of negative, doesn't it? When the new behavior is a habit and the patient has a high degree of self-confidence self that they can maintain this change and handle slips and temptations. And so at this point, you do informal praise and support all and support at all encounters. So for example, Jake, gee, it's going on three years since you stopped smoking. I bet that feels really good. And so you're just informally reminding them and keeping it up, and, and, um, but you don't really need to do anything about helping them at this point because you've moved on with Jake or whoever to the next challenge with them. Now if they stop smoking, let's get them exercising. Now this is really the heart of what I want you to learn. Um, you've learned lots of goals here, lots of skills. You've got the notes. You want to keep going back to those notes so that you remember how to do this because this is not simple stuff. Although once you get good at it, it is pretty simple. Uh, but once a patient is ready to change and set a plan and then throughout the time they're working on this change, you have to work with them on setting goals. And the goals have to be proper, the right goals, to be successful. You know, I can come in and see my healthcare provider and say, you know, I want to lose 50 pounds and that's my goal. And the provider says, great, okay, we'll write that down. Kate's goal is losing 50 pounds. Not going to happen. I, I mean, it might happen, but it's not going to happen just by setting the goal and moving forward. It's not the right kind of goal. And, you know, it's not the kind of goal that my provider can call me in a week and say, hey, Kate, how are you doing on losing those 50 pounds? Have you lost any weight yet? And so it's got to be done right. And that's what I want you all to get out of this talk. Here are right goals. Each goal should be small, very small, very, very small, specific, measurable, and very short term. Losing weight isn't it? Losing a hundred, you know, losing weight isn't specific. Losing a hundred pounds is specific, but it's certainly not small or short term. Here's one that is small, specific, measurable, and short term. This week, I'm going to walk around the block twice. That may be a big deal for some of your patients. I'm going to walk around the block twice. And if that patient is carrying 150 extra pounds on them, that is a lot of effort. And so, you know, that is a good goal that you can focus on with that patient. And then the patient feels good. They've accomplished something if they do it. So once a patient has set a goal, it's important that you assess their level of confidence and their ability to achieve this goal. And here's the kind of language you might use. Rachel, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being absolutely sure, how confident are you that you can cut the amount of soda you drink to not more than one can per day? Which is, see, there's a small specific goal um, that the patient has, patient Rachel. And pa Rachel says back, I would say on a, a scale, score of eight, I've been cutting back and I think I can decrease this level without any problems. Now, if a patient's confidence is an eight or higher, and they have, and you want them to think about this, this isn't just off the top of their head. So you remember in that last slide, Rachel said, "Here's why I think I can do this." If this isn't an eight or higher, the goal should be reconsidered, and it says here, or barriers explored. So whatever the patient's level of confidence is, it is helpful to ask them to identify anything in their week that might be a barrier to successful achieving this goal. So either if they say it's an eight or even if they don't say it's an eight, say, you know, after Rachel says, I've got my goal is an eight. Well, what might be a barrier to you achieving this goal? What might happen this week that would make you fall off the soda pop wagon, if you will? 
Here are some examples of barriers, how we might discuss barriers to change. Andrea set a barrier, a goal of swimming every evening after work, this, after, every evening this week after work. So you might say to Andrea, what kind of barriers might there be to you being able to achieve this goal of swimming every evening this week after work? And Andrea says, well, if my boss makes me work overtime, but that doesn't happen very often. Also, if I need to run errands, those might be, a, a, that might interfere with my ability to swim. So the provider says, well, maybe a goal of swimming every evening might be a little too much. And Andrea says, yeah, as I think about it, if I'm really honest, I don't think I could make it more than four times a week. And the provider says, so do you, do you want to change your goal to swimming four times this week? And Andrea says, yes, you know, that really is better. That's a 10. In other words, her confidence is 10 that she can do it four times this week. I'm trying to find my little mouse here. To, <laughs> I can't find my, there it is. Okay, I'm moving on. You've heard me talk about this relentless follow-up. All of the work just described is unlikely to be successful if you don't follow up and hold patients accountable for their decisions. So you or someone else, really everybody in the practice needs to commit to calling the patient. Well, I mean, not everybody needs to commit to calling, but they need to follow up. Somebody needs to commit to calling the patient at the end of the time established in the goal to determine what they are doing. Your patients are going to be shocked. <laughs> surprised, um, but we'll talk about that in the next slide. Okay, as I mentioned, initially patients will be surprised that you actually called or emailed them. I, you know, email patients. I would love to be emailed. That's my preference. But they'll be pleased, and then they'll begin to realize that you're taking this seriously, so maybe they better take it seriously. If they were successful in meeting their goal when you call, you can ask them, do you want to set a new goal? Or do you want to keep this one a little bit longer? Maybe swimming four times a week after work is a good goal for a couple weeks and they're really not ready to take anything on. If they weren't, then you go back and problem solve. Okay, what happened? Why not? What were the barriers? So discuss, um, discuss it and renegotiate the goal. Maybe this wasn't the right goal. But the patient see, will start learning how to do this too and you and the patient get into this dialogue about what the goals look like. Okay, we're really pretty much almost done here. I want to give you some references so that those of you who have a scholarly bent might be interested in some of the research that's been done on this. Very, very strong research. Um, and again, I didn't teach you anything in this class that was that complicated, but you have to get committed to doing it. And I just wanted to give you these references and then we'll go on in the final slide to your assignment. Okay, here's your assignment for this talk. Um, you're still using those aims and benchmarks, but I want you to go back and I want you to focus on self-management strategies to test. And so I want you to do something in the way of self-management strategies and submit at least two PDSA reports on how that strategy worked. And you know, one of the things I'm going to get to you all is I have a really nice worksheet that we use with patients for goal setting that um, can be kind of handy and I'm going to send you all a copy of that too so that you can use it if it will, see if it helps you. Um, thank you very much for your patience. I know this is a long talk and have a nice day and a good week.